rarely disturbed by the navigation of fishing boats or the occasional cruise ship, the Po River flows peacefully. Crossing the country from west to east, this 650 kilometer river, the longest in Italy, was an essential route for trade and cultural exchanges in northern Italy throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance. As the years passed, dazzling cities were born and died along its banks. On board the Michelangelo, we will discover some of these jewels, from Lombardy and Cremona, where the cruise begins, to the Adriatic and Venice, its final destination. Rising up out of the medieval city, Cremona's Campanile is the highest in Italy. Since its construction in 1267, life has peacefully continued under the shadow of the red brick edifice, reaching a height of almost 111 meters. The Piazza del Comune is its historic heart and the preferred strolling and meeting place of its inhabitants. Linked to the Campanile by an elegant portico, Cremona's Duomo with its pink marble facade is, despite some modifications, among the most beautiful examples of Lombardic Roman architecture. While the late 16th century marked the decline and end of a long period of economic prosperity, Cremona again became famous, this time through music, through its association with two great artists. The first, Claudio Monteverdi, is known today as the creator of opera, while Antonio Stradivari is still recognized as one of the world's greatest violin makers. Nearly three centuries after Stradivari's death, Cremona, world capital of instrument making, still welcomes visitors in its numerous young creators' workshops near the Piazza del Comune. Here they continue to honor tradition, while at the same time keeping up with innovation. I came to Cremona 17 years ago to become a violin maker. Before that, I had gone to a violin making school where I met my master, a Russian, named Alexander Krinov, a great violinist and violin maker, he taught me the art of making violins. Violins that make beautiful music. There are about a hundred workshops in Cremona, which employ around 300 people. A violin usually takes two months to complete. It's one month to make and one month for the varnish. Among the various kinds of wood used is pine, which has excellent acoustic qualities, especially when it comes from the Val di Flemia and Valle Canale. Altitude and soil are the most important contributors. The most beautiful wood comes from Bosnia and Montenegro. It has incredible grain, dense but very light. In the days of Stradivari and Guarneri del Giudu, the violins had a completely different sound. In the past, violin makers played a very important role. But we can also create our own sound. That's our mission. A good violin workshop is one that's alive, the product of the violin maker's energy and imagination. If not, it's just a dead workshop. By the early 18th century, 
Stradivari was producing his best work. In 1961, the city of Cremona purchased the best of the best, the Cremonese 1715. Every day, Professor Mosconi takes the masterpiece out of its window case to conserve its vitality and tone. My work is really beautiful because I get to play unique instruments created by the great violin makers of the past. From Andrea Marti, who founded the Cremona School, to Antonio Stradivari, to the most recent instruments from the Guarneri family. Stradivari is the most famous of the Cremona violin makers because he lived a long time, from 1644 to 1737. Over his lifetime, he made more than 1,100 instruments, violins, cellos, harps, guitars. He was the best because he achieved the highest level possible in his experiments with tone. Today, of over the 1,100 instruments Stradivari made, almost 600 have been identified. 400 of which are violins. The starting price for a Stradivarius in good condition, not even approaching the quality of the 1715 violins, like the one you just heard, can begin at over $2 million. At the Ponchielli Theater, the curtain goes up on gilding, sparkling as if intoxicated by the tones of Stradivari and the other great Cremonese violin makers. The image of the city long ago is slowly etched as the sun's setting rays lend the Po's meanderings an iridescent quality. Early the next morning, the Michelangelo charts a slow course for Venice. First stop, Boreto. Once out of the Alps, the Po flows in a gentle slope across Lombardy. Leaving Cremona, the single lock for almost 200 kilometers testifies to the region's flatness. Going through a lock poses few problems, the low level of the Po demands a great deal of vigilance. Sandbanks never very far off and whose positions change from one voyage to another constitute the principal danger. What is the draft of the, of the Michelangelo? One meter forty. What, what uh, distance of security do you have? Uh, uh, well, I have no distance. If I have ten centimeters left, I can, uh, I can sail. In 
the middle of the morning, we arrive at the Boreto Pontoon. Just after docking, we head off in the direction of Mantua. Surrounded by three lakes formed by the Mincio, a tributary of the Po, Mantua was a prosperous city in the Middle Ages. Using its strategic position, where several rivers meet to its advantage, Mantua taxed the many boats laden with merchandise, both coming from and going to Venice. But it was in 1328, when the Gonzagas took power, that the city met its destiny. For three centuries, the Gonzagas attracted poets, philosophers, and some of the greatest Renaissance painters to Mantua. What I find the most interesting is the urban quality of this palace, with its gardens and interior courtyards. It is a city unto itself which, although located outside the actual city, once controlled all of the activity within it. The Ducal Palace is composed of a complex of buildings dating from different periods and is also known as the city-shaped palace. We are in front of the oldest part of the palace. After 1390, the Gonzagas enlarged it by adding the colonnade, the large reception room on the second floor, with its enormous Gothic mullioned windows. Little by little, the buildings were linked by corridors, which in the beginning were only open air. But by the end of the 16th century, galleries and covered walkways spread over the entire palace. For centuries, until 1707, every Gonzaga generation contributed to the palace expansion. Seven gardens, eight courtyards, and a vast number of other buildings make up this city-like palace of almost 34,000 square meters. Today, this unique architectural ensemble with its rich mixture of styles provides an ideal setting to travel back in time. In the course of a single visit, one can go at random from the Middle Ages to the Classical period or from the Renaissance to the Baroque period. When the Gonzagas came to power in Mantua, which had previously been the Bonacol Sifiev, the Ducal Palace already had a crenellated facade. But mere military power alone would not suffice, and like the Medicis of Florence, it was through artistic patronage that the Gonzagas would establish their supremacy. All the great Italian Renaissance families like to surround themselves with artists. Their presence was a sign of prestige and reinforced their role, especially for the many families who weren't noble. In the second half of the 15th century, the position of the official court painter was bestowed on Andrea Mantegna, who would stay at the Mantova court from 1460 until his death in 1500. For the Gonzaga family, Mantegna painted the famous bridal chamber found in St. George's Castle within the Ducal Palace.
In a fictional space whose decor was inspired by classical antiquity, Mantegna indulged his taste for linear composition and his talent for the sculptural rendering of bodies and faces. The frescoes depict Francesco Gonzaga's return to the Gonzaga court after his nomination as cardinal and his reunion with his father Ludovic II, Duke of Mantua. The skill of the artist in depicting the faces in the court scene located on one of the chamber's walls allows for easy identification of certain family members, including Ludovic II discussing the letter announcing his son Francesco's nomination as cardinal with his secretary. Surrounded by her ladies-in-waiting, we also recognize Barbara of Brandenburg, the Duke's wife. With this series of frescoes, Mantegna did more than fulfill a commission glorifying his patrons, the Dukes of Mantua. He produced one of the masterpieces of 16th century painting. Back aboard the Michelangelo, our voyage continues towards the Adriatic. The river's low level and its uncharacteristically exposed riverbanks require the captain to proceed with extreme vigilance. Well, this river is, is very, uh, very fast, high and low because it is a nature river. Nothing stops the water. For example, last week it was raining and the river went up uh, five meters. And this week uh, all the five meters of water are gone. And uh, if I have all my engine on, I will not go faster, but I will take all the water with me and the waves will after the ship. For the second time since leaving Cremona, the Michelangelo passes through a lock. After a slow descent of a few meters, heavy steel doors open the way towards Venice. From here on, sailing through a more open landscape covered to the horizon with crops, especially vines, we navigate a heightened river where dikes have been installed to protect the plain from flooding. A few kilometers further, guided by the stone dikes, we enter the lagoon. For a few moments, we navigate, protected by the Lido, an offshore bar from the choppy sea. But this tranquility is only temporary. To travel to our next stop, Chioggia, inside another lagoon, we must first go out to sea. A river vessel, the Michelangelo, is equipped with a very small draft of about 1 meter 50. While the absence of any real keel to assure the boat's stability does not raise any problem for navigating the ship on a river or in a lagoon, 
this is no longer the case out on the open sea, especially when it's rough. To go in just a few hours from the flat calm of river navigation to the wind and the waves of the Adriatic is without doubt one of the most exciting moments of this voyage. If the waves were any bigger, such an adventure would have been impossible and the Michelangelo would have had to stay sheltered within the lagoon. Maneuvering his vessel with skill as it's tossed over the waves, the captain heads for Chioggia. Located between the open sea and the lagoon, Chioggia controlled the maritime and river traffic towards Padua until 1380 when it came under Venetian domination. It was at the heart of the rivalry between Genoa and Venice over the control of oriental trade. Since the time of the Romans, the principal activity in Chioggia has been fishing. Today, its port is still considered the most important in the lagoon. 6,000 fishermen haul in 40 tons of fish per day, destined for the Venice and Padua markets. Chioggia has kept its village charm and atmosphere. Wharves strewn with fish nets and rope, laundry hanging from the windows of houses like these built on sailboat masts. Chioggia is not known for its palaces and churches, but rather for strolling along its canals next to fleets of little colored fishing boats called bragozzo, and for taking shelter under the cool, shady galleries extending along under the houses. head for Padua, located about 40 kilometers inland. Donatello, Giotto, Galileo, Dante, Plutarch. So many artists, scientists, and writers of universal renown linked to Padua's history. But they are not its primary attraction, for millions of pilgrims from all over the world come to Padua every year to honor St. Anthony. What do you sell the most to tourists? Ah, the tourists. What they most often ask for are candles, because St. Anthony is the patron saint of miracles. People who come to Padua usually leave with candles and also medals, statuettes, key rings, small frames, and all kinds of rosaries. Do you believe in St. Anthony? Not really, not so much, because, well, it's not that I don't believe in St. Anthony. In fact, I don't believe because of everything that's going on around us. There are certain things that just shouldn't be happening. But who, in fact, was St. Anthony? Did he really exist? 
Saint Anthony really did exist. He was Portuguese, born in Lisbon in 1195. He didn't live in Padua very long, but he died here in our city on June 13, 1231. He entered the church at the age of 15 by joining the St. Augustine Brotherhood. He spent 10 years of his life in Coimbra, the capital of Portugal at the time. At the age of 25, drawn to the new Franciscan philosophy extolling poverty, the young Augustinian brother decided to serve the poor and join the Franciscan order, taking the religious name of Antony. He is buried in this marvelous church, built a year after his death. He was quickly canonized on May 30, 1232. One could say that his name has become forever linked with that of Padua. Far from the crowds and hustle and bustle prevailing around St. Anthony's Basilica, peace and quiet await us at the Scroveni Chapel. Leaving Chioggia, we continue our navigation, this time inside the lagoon. Over 50 kilometers long, the Venetian lagoon was born when the water suddenly rose following the end of the last glaciation, about 6,000 years ago. 
Very shallow, about one meter on average, the lagoon requires its boat's traffic to respect the routes marked out by buoys or groups of posts. The Dukes of Alba, or Bricole in Italian. Continuing our slow progression towards Venice, we pass very close to the islands of Pelestrina and Lido, which separate the lagoon from the Adriatic. Chased out by the Goths during the Middle Ages, the mainland inhabitants left for the islands, thus forming the first settlement in the lagoon. A doge was elected in 726, but it was the establishment of the Doga, the Rialto Island government in the 10th century, that the real construction of what was to become Venice began, namely that of stone foundations on piles. From a few small islands was to develop the maritime power that would dominate the Mediterranean for five centuries. I've lived in Venice for 30 years, and look, what a show, it's so beautiful. I think we're all in love with Venice. We're in a magic place, the customs point. All the ships pass through here when entering the seaport to deliver their merchandise, and before proceeding to the Rialto market, they had to pay duties, they had to pay to enter and to leave. And that's why this place is called La Dogana del Mar. Meaning sea customs. One mustn't forget that we don't have any cars. Everything is done by water. The seaport plays a very important role also. The cruise ships, which are in rapid development, bring in another kind of merchandise, but it's still commerce. By that, I mean tourism. Here, everything is done by boat, and I really believe that the seaport plays a very important role. Six thirty a.m. Like an architect's drawing, the Piazza San Marco begins to take shape in rectilinear angles. The thousands of tourists who invaded the area barely a few hours ago are still sleeping. Six thirty is the hour when Venice begins to awaken, as if with a hangover, not caring if it's been without makeup or pretense. Every year, the number of Venetians who live and work in the historical city diminishes. Over the last 30 years, almost 50,000 of them, having found neither housing nor employment in the tourist industry, have left for Mestre or Padua. Franco lives in the Dorso Duro district. Every morning, he crosses the Grand Canal by Vaporetto to go to work. Franco is a gondolier. Little 
prenderlo per forza vaporetto e ho abito in un'isola. I have to take a vaporetto because I live on an island. Naturalmente il mezzo per And in Venice it's the only means to go from one island to another. Since there are over 120 islands in all. Venice is back to its usual self. The line for the San Marco Basilica has already reached the middle of the Piazzetta. Mama, vieni qua. Hello. Ciao Mario Basana. Ciao Mario. Once dressed in his uniform, Franco reports for work at the Gondola station. Every gondolier has a number. He just has to wait his turn. The wait is never very long. There are 58 of us who work out of this gondola station. But in Venice, there are 405 gondoliers in all. Who owns a gondola? The gondola belongs exclusively to the gondolier. That's been the rule for... I don't know how many years. The rule was established a very long time ago. And it stated that the gondolier must own the gondola. The Gondolier Guild is very closed and licenses are most often passed from father to son. It's a far cry from the 18th century when the city contained 14,000 gondolas. At that time, gondolas were the only form of transport available. Reserved today for tourists, gondolas originally served to transport foodstuffs from the market to the palace. Because of its asymmetrical shape, it requires a certain dexterity to maneuver that can only come from years of practice. The first day, I started with my grandfather, who was a gondolier, and then with my father, who also came from a family of gondoliers. My first experience was here, at the front of the gondola. There was a hole with a focola, the fork upon which the oar sits, but a lot smaller. That's how, as a child, I learned to maneuver the oar in the water. The gondola was born at the same time as the city of Venice. The first gondola was built 1100 years ago. They are ideal for maneuvering along little canals, unlike motorboats, which are more and more numerous. The problem is that the canals are still as small as ever, while the boats are getting bigger and bigger.
Forget the silence of gondola navigation on the little San Marco canals. Vaporetto, motoscafo, taxis and boats of every kind run up and down the Grand Canal, the thoroughfare that snakes across Venice for almost four kilometers. At the heart of the peaceful Dorso Duro district, we find the Squero di San Trovaso, the oldest gondola shipyard in Venice. Today, there are only five squeri to service and repair the 400 Venetian gondolas. As for orders for new craft, they are increasingly rare. We build two or three gondolas per year, no more. A gondola is almost exclusively handmade. Oh, we use a few machines, but it's still a traditional art. The price varies according to the finish. First we build the basic model, then we add the decoration, the oars, the forcola. Altogether it can cost over $20,000. Its dimensions are nearly always the same, 11 meters long, 1 meter 40 wide. Oak, walnut, elm, cherry, larch or linden. It takes 280 pieces of wood to make a gondola and one single piece of metal, the iron that tops its prow. It symbolizes the city. The top represents the doge's hat. The six teeth represent the six areas of Venice, because Venice is divided into six parts. The isolated tooth represents Judaica Island. The part which joins the prow is the Grand Canal, and between the hat and the six parts, there's the Rialto Bridge. It was the Doge who decided, starting in 1600, that all the gondolas had to be the same. They had become more and more richly decorated. So when the crisis hit Venice, the Doge decided that from then on, they would all be identical. Navigating along the Grand Canal is like leafing through life-size pages of an art book devoted to Byzantine, Gothic, Renaissance, Classical and Baroque architecture. It's a unique architectural mix where churches and palaces, like so many accumulated riches, testify to five centuries of commercial and maritime supremacy. Forever linked with the image of the Grand Canal, and for a long time the only span across it, the Rialto Bridge has remained one of the emblematic symbols of Venice since it was built in 1591. As the city's commercial center for over a thousand years, the Rialto district has managed, despite the influx of so many tourists, to keep an authentic feel. A few cables lengths away from the Rialto is a neo-Gothic hall overlooking the Grand Canal, 
The fish market is supplied every morning by deliveries from various lagoon ports, notably from Chioggia. Just across from the market on the opposite bank is the Cadoro, the most famous of the Grand Canal palaces, demonstrating the harmonious marriage of its Gothic colonnades with decorative Byzantine detail. Built in 1442, its name comes from the gilding that originally covered its facade. In the 16th century, many palace facades were covered in frescoes and paintings. But contrary to the Cadoro, these adornments served most often to hide the defects of the materials and to unify the appearance of the building. The colors of the bricks and stones were enhanced with pigmented oils and varnishes, which also served to protect them. Having thus admired the Grand Canal Venetian palace facades, we could not resist the desire to go inside. What secrets are hidden behind these walls, which hosted hedonistic parties and carnival festivities? What remains of the spirit of Casanova, symbol of the 18th century Venice, a genuine pleasure capital? Descended from old Venetian aristocracy, we are received by Count Targhetta Dodifre in his palace. The Dodifres were made counts in 1054, and they were present at the first crusade, called the St. Louis Crusade. My relatives are Dodifre Paquiers who were made dukes by Louis-Philippe, the king of France. There's also the Dodifre Marquis, but me, I'm just a count, because it is the oldest name. Like most Venetian palaces, this luxurious bedroom probably contains a hidden door, a secret entry. Very costly furniture, sculpture and curios, Count Targhetta lives amidst sumptuous surroundings, a reflection of the grandeur of the past. But more than all his other treasures, what links Count Targhetta to Venice and its history are the splendors of Carnival. Michele, Michel, can you please open that wardrobe for me? Can you pass me that one? It's a hat in the Italian Renaissance style. They wore it like this in the time of Romeo and Juliet. I have some period costumes, but very often when they're worn, they come apart because the silk and taffeta are so delicate. The others are various costumes. Some I received as gifts, others I made myself. Here is a vest. Now, when nobles had eaten too much, the servants would open up the back of the vest. While the middle class, the bourgeois, unbuttoned the front of the vest themselves. <laughs> the 
One day, when the water was very high, there was about two inches of water. I made it to here thinking I would have to retrace my steps to go around the house. A young worker was passing by, pretty well built, about 25 years old. I saw him throw his shoes and socks on the ground. He said, climb up on me. He lifted me over to the other side. I said to him, let me give you something to buy yourself a pack of cigarettes, a glass of wine. He said, no, no, bye-bye. And off he went. I love Venice. I love it when it rains, when it snows. I even love its flaws. Sometimes when I arrive here by train, there's the smell of the lagoon, which some people might find unpleasant. But for me, it's like a horse coming home to the stable. I love the smell of the stable. The visit to Venice ends where it started, in the Piazza San Marco. <laughs> the sun's setting rays light up the facade of the Basilica, setting the mosaics on fire, reminding us that Venice was once one of the jewels of the Byzantine Empire. After 1,000 years of existence, during which it has never ceased to fascinate the world, what destiny lays before Venice? Venice, a city against nature, as Chateaubriand once called it, attracts millions of tourists from all over the world every year. Will they slowly transform this commercial city into an open-air museum? And how long will the sea continue to preserve Venice, from which it forged power and beauty, from total disappearance?